circumstances. The end of a boxing legend. 27 years after Freddie Mills' death, why do people still ask, was it murder or was it suicide? She broke the moral codes of her time, but could Louise Massett kill her own son? Or did an innocent woman go to the gallows, the victim of Victorian values? I'm Edward Woodward. Tonight, on In Suspicious Circumstances, we investigate the capability of the human spirit. Could, for instance, a man, literally a born fighter, take his own life? Was a mother capable of brutally bludgeoning her baby son to death? Two classic cases, two sets of suspicious circumstances. The price of fame. For most people, perhaps, an academic question. But bearing in mind the rewards, it is something that most people might gladly pay for. And once achieved, it is an exceptional man or woman who walks away from the limelight. Now, as a sportsman, your time in the limelight can be very short indeed. So what do you do for the rest of your life? I mean, to prove that you're still something, you're still somebody, and not just another Tom, Dick, or Freddy. Now, this rang a bell with me right away, which is nothing unusual because I often hear bells. It rang a bell and reminded me of the seconds in my corner the night I'd bought that big American fella, Joe Maxey. There I was, sat in the corner, blood all over the place. And a second, a second looked down at me and he smiled so sweetly. Seconds do, you know, and he said, Don't worry, Freddy. Just stand up, boy, he said. You'll think of something. Well, of course I didn't. And I got a bloody good hiding. <laughs> By 1950, when the boxer Freddie Mills finally hung up his gloves, his face and his name were definitely in the limelight. 96 professional fights over nine years had earned him the light heavyweight championship of the world and over £100,000 in prize money. In a sport littered with broken men, Freddie had come through seemingly unscathed. After boxing, he had established a second career as a successful businessman and show business personality. To the public, Freddie had retired a national hero, a living legend. <laughs> Freddie Mills was found dead in the early hours of Sunday the 25th of July, 1965. He had been shot at point-blank range through the right eye with a .22 rifle. <laughs> Freddy had been killed, in fact, by a bullet no bigger than this. But was it suicide? The Westminster coroner had no doubts. There had been nothing to suggest a struggle of any kind, he said, and the wound was obviously self-inflicted. He had heard, he added, that Freddie had business worries. But as far as Freddie's wife, Chrissy and his family were concerned, the very idea of Freddie Mills, of all people, killing himself was totally inconceivable. To his family, indeed to the public, Freddie was the scrapper who just never knew when he was licked and just carry on coming at you, however hard you're belted in, and would still laugh it off later as if nothing had happened. Even if the reality of it was rather different. Look at me. Are you all right, Fred? Ted Broderick, Freddie's manager and father-in-law. Look at me. Freddie's career had been a brutal one. Following his fight against Gus Lesnovich in 1946, he was never able to take a blow in the face again without experiencing pains in the head and dizziness.
but the level of punishment then thought acceptable meant that only three weeks later Broadrib steered him into the ring for yet another battle. It's a testament to Freddie's endurance that he could come back two years later in 1948 to fight Lesnovich and win the light heavyweight championship of the world. Perhaps Freddie should have quit then when he was ahead. But then Freddie didn't know the meaning of the word, and of course there was the money. So Freddie slogged on for two more punishing years. After that, even Broadrib decided that enough was enough. Not that Freddie was in on the decision. Chrissy! Chrissy, have you read this? Hey? Mills quits the ring, it says, and that is definite. He's retired me. Your father's bloody well gone and retired me. Yeah, and if he hadn't, I would have. What? For God's sake, Fred, you're going to end up on a slab? One of these days, that's what's going to happen. And where does that leave me? I've got to stay in this too, you know. Yes, but Chris... Yes. I'm telling you. It's over, Freddie. It's finished. Chrissy, if I don't fight, what am I going to do? Look, your name means something out there. It really does mean something. So? So use it. Let your name be the fighting in future. If anyone's earned a right to do that, you have. And use it they did. Freddie and his partner Andy Ho already had a thriving Chinese restaurant in London's Charing Cross Road. With that and a regular stream of television and radio appearances, a future seemed positively rosy for Freddie and Chrissy Mills. But by the late 50s, London was awash with Chinese restaurants, each competing for trade. So, 13 years after he quit the ring, Freddie embarked on the biggest gamble of his career, turning his restaurant into a nightclub, Freddie Mills' night spot. Well, it made sense. After all, Freddie was a great showman, bubbling personality, and showbiz pals. Freddie's name and face could still pull in the punters. To his friends, however, his biggest gamble would be his greatest mistake. It took Freddie into a world he knew little about, where money was really all that mattered. It brought him new pressures. Sorrow when our love was breaking up, memory of a broken heart. Later on the joy of making up, never ever more to part. There's one thing left to do, before my heart is through. I've got to take you for my wife Then the story of my life can start And end with you Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Thank you all right, all right, all right, all right. I know I was crap, but he was, he was terrific, wasn't he? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together once again for your friend and my friend, Mr. Michael Holliday. Yeah! yeah. Okay, okay. Well, Never had time for young girls when he was boxing. So he's making it for the middle age. Yeah, in a minute, darling, I'll be back in a minute. Quiet. So, who are we talking about then? Hmm? Who are we talking about? You, of course. Who else? Oh, well, that's all right then, isn't it? Listen, Chrissy, love, can you just excuse us for a minute? I've got a little bit of business I want to talk about with Andy. Give me another hundred, we're only a bit short tonight. Another hundred? What are you doing with all this money? In one of those weeks, you know? All right, all right. But I'll have to put it through the books this time. Yeah, all right, put it through the books. That's your end of the shop. I mean, I do my thing, you do yours, all right? Give me 100 pounds. Listen, stop worrying. You worry too much. You know what they say? You fast, die young, and you have a nice course, all right?
But if there were pressures, there were also consolations. Freddy. Yes. It's a real blind up. Yeah. Thanks. The affair lasted for three years. Until one day, Chrissy got to hear the back. Chrissy! 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 Open the door! You've locked me out. That's right. Well, what am I going to do? Why don't you go back where you've been? Chrissy! Chrissy! been through this again and again. I can't take it any longer. So I'll tell you what. You go to her with my blessing. What are you talking about, Mummy? Me and the kids got to live our own lives. I'll give it six months. What are you on about? I couldn't leave you and the kids. You'll have to make up your mind. One way or the other. Here. What's this? It's her key, isn't it? What? The key to a flat, just take it, get rid of it. So Chrissy won, but giving up the girl hit Freddie hard. Perhaps too hard. Still, this was only one of his problems. The club had gone into a rapid decline. After just a few months, it seemed, the only showbiz pals coming into Freddie's night spot had troubles of their own. The singer Michael Holliday had met Freddie when they appeared together on television in the 6-5 special. They had become close friends. I mean it, Freddie. Marge has left me. She's taken the kids. But why? Why do you think? I mean, you know me and women. you see. I really can't. Yeah, but even so, Michael, come on, life is worth living. Come on, he's got to buck up, hasn't he, Mummy? Yeah, it'll work out. Of course it will, of course it will. Freddie talked to Michael Holliday for several hours. By the end, he was convinced that his friend had been talked out of suicide. It's true, come on, let's have a drink. The next morning, Holliday was found dead from a massive drug overdose. Freddie was devastated. The day after Michael Holliday's death, Freddie Mills resigned from the Samaritans. He told Chrissy, if I can't talk a man out of suicide on my own doorstep, what the hell do you surmise of the Samaritans? Did that sense of failure, I wonder, hound Freddie to the grave? There was failure enough. His nightclub, a broken romance, the loss of a close friend. But perhaps more importantly was the fact that by the now swinging 60s, the face and name of Freddie Mills didn't quite fit anymore. New personalities replaced him on television and radio. To put it cruelly, he was becoming a relic of the past. 15 months after Michael Holliday's death, did Freddie also decide to throw in the towel? One decision Freddie did make 
was to go to Battersea Fun Club. Six days before his death, he visited an old friend, May Ronaldson, who ran a shooting gallery. Hello, Freddie. Show us how to do it. No, uh, no, thank you, love. I mean, you know me and guns. I'm, uh, I'm opening a fade on Saturday, see, over at Isha. And I wanted to go as a cowboy, and I need a rifle. I thought you just said you didn't like guns. I can't be a cowboy without a rifle, can I, May? No. Hang on, I've got a thing for you. Here, this will take you down to the ground. Yeah, why is that then? It don't work. Oh, that's perfect. That's great. Hey, how high do you think that is? The Ferris wheel? Yes. I don't know. Say, 80 to 100 feet, maybe? Did Freddy's visit to the fairground banish the last lingering doubts about suicide? What's wrong with it, exactly? The police certainly thought so. But anyone who knew Freddie Mills simply couldn't believe it. I mean, after all, Freddie wasn't just pro-life. He positively embraced life. He believed passionately that however tough things got, life was still for the living. And this is what he had told Michael Holliday. Your mother gave you that life to do something with, not to waste it. Now you just remember that, all right? I wish I could believe that to you. You remember it, Michael, and you believe it. Because it's true, all right? Those do not seem to be the sentiments of a man who was going to commit suicide. And certainly, Freddie's behavior that last Saturday hardly seemed to have been that of somebody seriously considering ending it all. That day, Freddy's routine was like any other Saturday. He bought his week's supply of cigarettes, spent a large part of the day working in the garden. How are you doing, then? Terrific, Mummy. I'll just finish this. I can go for a swim tomorrow morning, can't I? I think I'll come down the club tonight, OK? That's great, yes, great. Eddie, that's the thing. Oh, where are the Where are they? They're on the radio, are they? Shall we dance? Shall we dance? Shall I get Mummy to dance? Shall I? Shall I? Yes. Come on, Mummy, come and have a dance. Come on, come and dance. It's fun. Are we really being asked to believe that this was a man who a few hours later would kill himself without leaving the family he adored any sort of suicide note? Would he then use a gun? A thing he was known to have hated and which he would have had to have put in working order. And would he shoot himself in the eye of all places? Let's take a closer look at just what is alleged to have happened during those last three hours of Freddie Mills' life. Hello, Bob. Now, he arrived at the club just after 10.30 took a quick look inside, found the place almost empty, and so went for his usual evening nap. And he was certainly alive half an hour later when Bob Deacon, the doorman, came to the car. What is it, Bob? The club's still pretty empty, Mr. Mills. All right, call me in another half hour, will you? When Deacon went back half an hour later, Freddie was now in the back of the car, apparently asleep. Two further attempts were then made to wake him, one by the head waiter and Freddy, one by Andy Holmes. Freddy, wake up. But it was only when Chrissy Mills and her son Donnie arrived that they discovered the truth. could try to waken Mills without one of them even realizing that he'd been shot. But the mystery doesn't stop there. If we look at what was supposed to have happened here inside the car. First of all, there is the matter of the mysterious second bullet hole. Two shots, 
Not one was fired from the rifle that night. And one of them into Freddie Mills' brain, the other into the door. Here. And the police explanation for that? That Freddie had, first of all, attempted to shoot himself while sitting in the driver's seat of the car and had, well, missed, you see. And then he had decided to repeat the exercise from here, the back seat. Now, according to Chrissy Mills, she found Freddie here in the back seat. The rifle placed by his side like this. Freddie's face was slumped forward, so, and his hand placed like this on his knee. Now, no position is really comfortable for shooting yourself with a 2 2 rifle in the back seat of a car. But the most likely, if not ideal, angle, surely, would be this. However, if he did shoot himself from this position, the gun would surely have fallen away from Freddy onto the front seat. Now, it would have been just about possible for Freddy to shoot himself from this angle. But if he had, could the gun have then fallen down into this position? But it could have. But then would his hands have ended up here? Now some would say that this was pushing the bounds of probability just a little too far. But if it really was murder, then who murdered him? This was Soho in the 60s. And Freddy's club had already been the center of poor girl scandal. In those last days, all sorts of unsavory characters had started patronizing the place. And it wasn't the likes of Bob Hope and Gene Simmons that Freddie Mills was rubbing shoulders with anymore. Hi, hey, Freddie! Johnny. Everything that's rotten in London. No. Really? Uh, Ronnie, you know what my missus has just been telling me? Now she reckons you're the head of just about everything that's rotten in London. <laughs> Don't worry, Fred. We wouldn't hurt you, mate. You know that. <laughs> Freddie's world had shrunk from that of international celebrity to the seedy sidelines of the Soho underworld. Did it eventually drag him under? By the time he died, his prize money of £100,000 had all gone. His will left £347, and his house had been secretly mortgaged for £4,000. No one has ever satisfactorily answered the question, where did the money go? Was Freddy the victim of an extortion racket? On that fateful night, did Freddy's inability or unwillingness to pay exact the ultimate price? The murder theory must, despite its plausibility, remain speculation. Perhaps in her highly emotional state, Chrissy Mills may have been mistaken about the position of the gun, and indeed the position of her husband's hand. Perhaps it wasn't really gangsters that killed Freddie Mills, but depression brought about by his worsening financial situation, his, his headaches, the growing realization that suddenly his name, his face, and his position had gone, along with everything else. Perhaps. There does remain, however, a small matter of the letter. And one that author Jack Berkeley received after writing a book about Freddie's death. It is, of course, anonymous, as you might expect. The letter claims that Freddie was definitely murdered by somebody he called the governor. Freddie was killed 
because he couldn't pay anymore. The writer of the letter had in fact been offered the contract himself, but had turned it down because he liked Freddy. Freddy had not in fact borrowed the gun to kill himself with, but for his own protection. And on that last night, Freddy had fired the gun and managed to scare off the hitman who had been sent to kill him. Well, that would explain the bullet hole that went into the car door. But then the mysterious governor turned up, somebody, the letter says, who was still trying to make his name up west. And because Freddy knew him, he relaxed. And it was then, according to the letter, that Freddy made his fatal mistake and when the governor seized his chance and killed him. So, a crack letter, the violent fantasy of some ex-con, well, as a confirmation of his credentials as a professional hitman, the writer also claims to have carried out a contract on a London prostitute called Black Rita. Black Rita certainly existed. And Black Rita was certainly murdered. <laughs> On insuspicious circumstances, the case of Louise Masset. Did she commit the unthinkable and murder her infant son, or was she the innocent victim of Victorian values? October 1899 the twilight months of a dying century. The London of the naughty 90s, the time of the can-can. Can-can, the dance of desire that to the Victorians conjured up the image of the true city of decadence, Paris. Louise Masset, half French herself, Louise was a singular woman. She refused to be constrained by the moral confines of Victorian society. She never expressed the slightest sense of shame at having a three-year-old love child. And, unlike so many unmarried mothers of the time, Louise had not abandoned her son. Manfred was boarded with a foster mother, his upkeep paid for by his natural father in France. Louise visited him regularly, and to all who knew her, it was clear that she loved her son very much. But on this particular weekend, Louise had other loves other desires. Perhaps that weekend, Louise was dreaming of Paris. Paris, however, was too far away for a stolen weekend of passion. But Brighton wasn't. And wasn't Brighton the Paris of the British? Brighton might just be possible with a little harmless deception. Perhaps her dream was stirred by such a poster in a railway waiting room. Certainly Louise was unaware that it was the waiting room itself that would shape her destiny. Or rather, three such railway waiting rooms. The first, where she and her son were seen together for the last time. The second, where the boy's body would be found naked and suffocated. And the third, in Brighton itself, where she would greet her lover and where the clothes of her dead child would be found. In the first week of the 20th century, Louise Masset was hanged for the premeditated murder of her son, Manfred. Did an innocent woman go to the gallows? had lived in Stoke Newington, North London, with one of her married sisters for the past 18 months. There she taught piano and French. Just put it like this. Oh. 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 Uh. 
Lucas was literally the boy next door, a medical student, 19 years old. Frank Stone at Winter. I feel like a schoolboy. My best pupil. You remember what I told you? I worked it all out. I'm taking you to Brighton. <laughs> Wouldn't you like that? I doubt your sister would approve. I told her I'm taking Manfred to France on Friday to be with his father. So we have the whole weekend. Shall I? <laughs> no. I've made other arrangements for Manfred. Just the two of us. Alone. A passionate lover? A devoted mother? Would she be both? Given her particular circumstances, it was a difficult question for Louise. But she was a resourceful woman. And so on Friday, the 27th of October, 1899, Louise traveled the three miles to Tottenham. There, waiting for her, was her son Manfred, in his Sunday best. With Helen Gentle, the woman who had fostered him almost from birth. After almost four years, this was to be a painful party. Louise had told Miss Gentle that he was to be raised by his father in France. The next time Miss Gentle saw Manfred was to identify his body in the local mortuary. London Bridge, the first of three station waiting rooms. 3 p.m. The Brighton train was to leave within the hour. Mrs. Rees, the attendant, had just started what would be a long shift. I know you. Going for a train? No. We're waiting for someone, but they haven't arrived. What's sweating him? He's had to leave his nurse. This was the last sighting of mother and child together. At the trial, Louise Masset did not disagree with Mrs. Weese's account of their first meeting, but she did disagree with Mrs. Weese's statement that she saw her four hours later at 7 p.m. alone, washing her hands in the wash room. Louise claimed she caught the four o'clock Brighton. If she had, she could not have killed her son. On a busy day, and this was indeed a busy day, the washroom was used by perhaps 400 women. Mrs. Reese had to wear glasses for reading and to see at a distance. Today, she had left them at home. But this is another washroom in the ladies' waiting room, Dalston Junction. Louise's local station, more than half an hour away from London Bridge. It is six o'clock. Behind the door, naked, 
wrapped only in a cheap black shawl, man approached the bottom. He had been knocked unconscious by a heavy blow and then suffocated. A blood-stained brick lay by his side, a common enough brick, but a brick identified as being of the same type as made up the rockery in the garden of Louise's home. Louise did not sign into her hotel until 9.45. She claimed that on arrival of the four o'clock train from London, she had immediately made her way down to the sea, marveled at the whiteness of the pavilion, strolled along the magical pier before eating at a restaurant named Mutton. And then, and only then, going to seek out her room. And there she lay, forgetful of the boy, mindful only of the keys that would unlock the door to her passion. And she lay waiting, waiting. Saturday afternoon, 3.20 p.m., Brighton Station. There were to be three vital pieces of evidence against Louise. The clinker brick found next to Manfred's body at Dalston Station, Mrs. Reese's sighting of her in the washroom at London Bridge, and the most damning of all, the fact that 20 minutes after meeting Lucas, Manfred's clothes will be discovered here in the Brighton waiting room. Louise was to pay dearly for a weekend of love. The two of them returned to London on the Sunday night. On Monday, she went to work as normal. Manfred was identified in the newspapers on Monday evening. Later that night, an apparently distressed Louise appeared at the house of her second sister in Croydon, claiming to have just read the report and panicking that the police might suspect her of the crime. There, she was arrested and charged by the police. The case for the prosecution was quite straightforward. Louise Massett had lied about taking Manfred to his father's. She had not caught the four o'clock to Brighton, but had returned unseen to the washroom at Dalston Junction, where she had savagely murdered her child stripping him of his clothes and striking him with a brick around the face to hamper identification. She then caught a later train to Brighton where she callously spent the weekend with her lover. There, carelessly, she had left a parcel of Manfred's clothes. Once the child had been identified, she fled to South London to evade escape. It was, the prosecution argued, abundantly clear that Louise Massett was a willful, intelligent, self-possessed, and shameless woman capable of anything. The defense asked if Louise was so intelligent, so calculating, would she have created lies so easily exposed? No motive had been suggested, but in English law, it is not essential. But would such a woman, even with a motive, be so unwise as to take a brick from her own back garden, kill the child in her local railway station, leave the murder weapon by his side, wash her hands in the very waiting room they had just been seen in before, and then carelessly leave the child's clothes in Brighton Station. If then she panicked, would not such a resourceful woman find a better place to hide than her sister's house? And why, most of all, would a woman wanting sympathy on the death of her child choose to offend the moral codes of decency by spending the weekend in Brighton with her young lover? Besides, Louise had her own version to tell me. The prosecution considered it a fantasy, a pack of lies, a fairy tale. A fairy tale it might be. If it is, it is one worthy of the brother's grin. Louise's story begins with a chance meeting in a London park in September 1899. Good afternoon. This is Millie. How have you been, Millie? Very well, thank you. Good. The children bumped into each other regularly in the park. And, of course, the mothers began to talk. When my husband died, it was a great shock. 
Unfortunately, my sister-in-law Sarah came to stay. That was six months ago. It was a great help. Some sisters aren't always so supportive. I live with one of mine. On uh, Bethune Road. Bethune Road, isn't it? Isn't that where Mrs. Long used to live? Yes. What number are you? 29. Oh, no, she lived much further down the road until she moved. Oh, the joys of moving. <laughs> well, we're heavily involved in that at present. My husband didn't leave us quite as well provided for as he would have hoped. Husbands are not always quite as reliable as they seem to think, are they? Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to pry. Forgive me, please. Quite all right. Manfred's father lives in France, but he provides adequately for him. And Manfred has a very good nurse. The two of them get on so well together. I'm afraid Manfred doesn't meet many children. Has the nurse none of her own? No. Five. What comes after five, Manfred? Ten. No, silly, six. A child needs company. And education. You fear he's not being well provided for in that direction? Oh, he has love. She does all she can. Well, then angels can't expect better. <laughs> but mothers do, don't they? I know I should make some decision on the matter soon, but it... Well, we might be able to help you there. We're setting up a small private school. Sarah here's a teacher. Louise and the Brownings agreed to meet again the following week. <laughs> oh, he loves it. I don't seem to be able to... Millie, go and look after Manfred. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's so good to him. I didn't think you'd be out in this weather. We have some good news. Sarah and I have taken a lease on a house with a closed garden at the rear. It will make an excellent school with accommodation for six children. We have a number already, but, well, it would break Millie's heart if Manfred were not one of them. <laughs> and where is it? Uh, King's Road, Chelsea. Oh, it's, it's a long way away, I really not that far. You'd still be able to visit every Wednesday. Yes. But it's enough. I, I don't want to hurt her feelings. You don't want to deprive your child either. We don't want it in any way to force you. But uh, at the rate we offer for the year, well, you understand. We can't wait. Well, we've already moved. This is our last time in this park today. Well, how will I get there? Well, uh, let's meet you somewhere halfway. Then we can take you over there and you can see the boys settled in. Uh, London Bridge Station? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Two o'clock. Bring everything with you and we'll sort it out. You can rest assured. <laughs> and we promise to keep him out of puzzle. <laughs> And it was then, she claimed, that she thought of combining all her desires in one weekend. With a small ride and his gentle, she could secure Manfred's future. With another to her sister, she could equally secure her weekend of passion. She planned to catch the four o'clock to Brighton from London Bridge, and that left two hours, more than enough, to see her son safely installed at his new school. <laughs> Thank you. 
Aunt Augusta. I plan to be on the next train to Brighton. Oh, my dear, I am so sorry. I had no idea. What is it, Manfred? He wants a cake. Oh, I'll take you for a cake. He's been crying. But why? Millie's waiting for you. She's got all her games out in the playroom. You wouldn't want Millie to see you've been crying, would you? There. Manfred! Don't worry, he'll be fine. But I don't have time now. Settle him in no time. Your distress is probably disturbing him more than anything. Do you have his things? And do you have the 12 pounds? I, I, I'm not... 45 Kings Road. Do you think you'll remember that? Look, as soon as I get back, I'll write you a letter with a receipt and full directions and let you know he's settling in. Then you can be with him on Wednesday. Children are always like that. Bite of a cream cake and they've forgotten everything. You go and get some sea air. Treat yourself a little. Wednesday. You'll be a different boy. Mrs. Browning and her sister-in-law were never traced. In the smoke and smog of Victorian London, they had disappeared like shadows in the night. It was reported that as they tied the noose round Louise Massett's neck, she whispered, what I have to suffer is just. Justice has been done. Perhaps it was this moment, this simple failure to be a responsible mother that was to haunt her to the end. Did the Brownings exist at all? If they did, were they then the murderers? Had they carefully picked their victim, a young, unmarried mother, concerned about her child's education? Had they taken a few simple precautions to throw blame on her? A brick from her garden left conveniently by the body? And then perhaps a little outing with a small parcel of clothes to Brighton Station? school in King's Road was, of course, a fiction. But whose fiction was it? Theirs or Louise Massey's? The jury decided it was hers. The guilty verdict took them less than 15 minutes. And yet there was nothing but the most circumstantial of evidence. There was no indication by Manfred's death that she would gain any financial benefit. Quite the opposite. There was no suggestion of marriage in the offing, where a love child might be an impediment. There was not the slightest indication of her ever expressing any antipathy towards the child. I mean, at the very least, one might have supposed a little doubt, surely. But perhaps Louise Massett was tried for a different crime, a crime for which she was never charged. Louise was certainly a liar in a world of hypocrisy, a temptress of young men, a woman who had apparently suffered no hardship for her past moral lapses, a woman who seemed to give no allegiance to the established code. Were the jury themselves guilty, punishing her as a warning to others? Was that the factor that weighed most heavy on the scales of justice? Four days prior to the execution, the owner of Mutton's Restaurant Brighton, together with a waiter, signed official statements that Louise Massett ate on their premises between 6 and 7 p.m. on the night of the murder. The defense asked for an official stay of execution to allow positive identification to take place. The Home Office refused. Louise Massett was hanged at Newgate at nine o'clock on the morning of January the 9th, 1900. It is an interesting thought, is it not, that the next woman to hang at Newgate was Ada Chard Williams, executed for the murder for profit of a two-year-old illegitimate child 
which had been fostered out to her by a young unmarried mother. Good night.